people do not like this piece of advice. If you are running on two separate tracks when it comes to your marriage, specifically with your money, it's hard to win financially on a logistical level, but also an emotional level. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Rachel Crusoe podcast. So glad that you're here. Well, on today's episode, I'm actually going to interview my dad, Dave Ramsey, and we're going to talk about 10 things to do differently in 2021. I'm also going to answer a question from my Facebook community about what a high schooler should be doing to save for college. But first, let's dive into the best money plan around the baby steps. That's right, it's beginning of the new year and people really wanna get in control of their money. So if you wanna get in control of the baby steps, this plan is the best one. So let's dive into the very first step, which is baby step one and how to save $1,000 quickly. So take a listen. This first step, it's a really hard one, but it's also an easy one. And it's an easy one because it's $1,000. And we'll talk about ways to save for that here in a little bit, but you can do it. I believe it. I believe you can do this. But it's also a hard step because this is the first step where you're saying, I'm going to do something different with my money. Like I've been doing the same thing over and over again, and it's not working out the way I want it to. And so I'm actually going to do a different plan. I'm going to try something different. And change is hard for so many people, even me. Even my two-year-old, three-year-old Caroline. I mean, sweet Caroline. I remember I switched their car seats This was like a month ago. I may have already told the story on the show. I can't even remember. But then we switched the car seats. And you would think I was like torturing her in the back seat. I'm like, Caroline, just sit on this side of the car. She's like, I I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm like, yes, she doesn't even like change, okay? No one likes change. But when you engage in this process, you have to change. But you have to have hope that what you're changing to is better than your present. So that is this first step. It is saying, okay, I'm going to make a change and I'm going to save $1,000. So when you think about the emergency fund, what this really is, it's your safety net between you and life. And you want this money there in case something happens so you don't go swipe a credit card. You actually have cash in the bank. And it's going to be hard, again, because this is tough, because emergencies are going to happen. And some people think, $1,000, is that enough? It's not really enough. That's why you got, you got to do it fast and you got to get through baby step two to get to baby step three. So knowing, okay, yes, this is not going to be forever and there are chances you're going to spend that $1,000 on emergencies, but that is okay. It's okay to start back over on baby step one. It's going to happen. But that's okay because you are doing life different now. Remember that. Now, just like your emergency fund is your safety net, your life insurance policy is a different kind of safety net. So no matter where you are in the baby steps, you have to have term life insurance. If something were to happen to you, who would provide for your family? And I'm not just talking about income. If you're a stay-at-home parent, who's going to provide the childcare and the cleaning and the transportation, everything that goes into that? If you or your spouse were to pass unexpectedly, the last thing anyone wants to deal with is a financial stress on top of all the grief. So that's why I can't talk about term life insurance enough. Because even though you guys hear me talk about it a lot, I bet some of you are putting it off. Don't put this off. Connect with my friends at Xander Insurance because they do all the shopping around for you to get you the best rate. Tell them you'd need a policy for 10 to 20 times your annual income. And for a stay-at-home parent, get 10 to 20 times the value of what you provide for your family each year. Xander will save you time and money and give you the peace of mind that life insurance is there for. So go to Xander.com. Okay, let's talk about 20 easy ways that you can find $1,000 for your emergency funds. Turn off the TV. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm like, why is Frozen still on? No one's in the room. Why is it still on? Turn off the lights. Yeah, my parents were always big light turner offers. Turn off the light, turn off the light, turn off the light. It does, it saves you money. You can sell some stuff. Look around your house. What is stuff you don't use? Sell it, make money. You can donate plasma. Brew your own coffee at home. I do this. I love my coffee. Pack your own lunch. Don't go out to eat. Get a second job. And what's great is that there's so many apps for all the odd jobs out there that can be flexible with your schedule. So for dog walking, there's WAG. For grocery store delivery, there's Shipped. Restaurant delivery, there's Postmates or Uber Eats. So many options out there. Next, embrace the 24-hour rule before you make a purchase. So if there's a big purchase coming up, just wait 24 hours and see if you still want it. 
Also, you can use my rule of asking the question, if no one saw this purchase, do I still want it? Yeah, that'll save you some money. Set up automatic deposits into your savings account of each paycheck, so it automatically goes in. Do a no-spend challenge. Those are good. Start couponing. Wash your laundry with cold water. Forget the hot. On a night that you normally just go out to eat, challenge yourself to only eat what's in your pantry. Cut the cable completely. Switch to generic versus store brand. Use a slow cooker and then freeze any leftovers you have. Shop consignments for your kids' clothes. Reevaluate your cell phone bill. You can make some cuts there. Shop for all your needs on Facebook Marketplace, like appliances, electronics, sports equipment, anything like that. And of course, this will only help you if you actually put all that money that you saved into a savings account. Yes, put that money away. Now, if you implement half this list, I bet you could have your emergency fund fully funded in just a month or two. Yeah, just a thousand bucks is what you need. And if you need a little extra inspiration, here are a few exciting comments from my Facebook community about saving up for an emergency fund. Trisha said, so glad for the emergency fund. My car battery died after six years. It had had enough. So glad I had extra money for a new battery. Car problems give me anxiety. Tiffany said, my old normal would be if I had an emergency, I would have to not pay a bill on time. Now with my $1,000 emergency fund, I was able to take my cat to the vet because her paw was injured. I wish I had done this 20 years ago. Oh, so glad the cat's okay. Laura said, baby step one is completed. Wow, I feel so empowered to anyone on this step. You can do it. I love it, you guys. So what are you waiting for? This is the time where you say, you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do this plan. I'm going to build my $1,000 emergency fund. So get after it so that you can take control of your money and create a life you love. Being a parent is hard today, especially when screens are everywhere. And you want to feel good about what your kids are watching without worry. That's why my family loves Minnow. It's a new streaming service created just for kids. With over 2,000 hand-picked episodes that's rooted in a Christian perspective, Minnow helps your child learn about Jesus, the Bible, and all the amazing things that God has created. So feel more comfortable about your media choices that you're making and start watching Minnow today. Download the Minnow app or visit GoMinnow.com. That's G-O-M-I-N-N-O.com to get your free trial. Your second favorite personal finance experts here. Could be the fourth or fifth. Dave Ramsey. <laughs> you might be down the list. Yeah, I don't know. Here we go. That, that feels about right. No. Thanks for being back. My plan's working. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for letting me come back. Yeah. So we're in January, and so we're starting off 2021. And a lot of people have New Year's goals, New Year's resolutions to fix their money. We see that a lot. A lot mm -hmm. of people talk about health, and a lot of people talk about their financial health as well. Yeah. I mean, we 30 years ago, I started doing this. It's, you know, January 1st is... Quit smoking, lose weight, save money, get out of debt, you know. And so money goals are always top of mind because we're setting a new year. And with the dumpster fire of 2020 in our rearview mirror, yeah, we need some goals. No. We need some stuff to go after here. Yes. But don't you think, I mean, it's not like a magic wand. And when the calendar turns to this year, I mean. <sighs> you know, it's not. But what, it's, <laughs> it's not. But what it does, it, gives, it does give you perspective. Yes, that's because fair. Because you say, okay. That's it's fair. a milestone. There's a marker here that says, okay, new stuff ahead, all stuff behind. It's not perfect. You yes. always you always carry some of it with you into the yes. next year. But we also know we get a fresh start. We yep. get a do-over. We get grace. There's, we get a whiteboard that doesn't have anything written on it. Yep, yep. There's like a mentality shift, you know, when you start the new year. So we want to do some things that are different this mm -hmm. year. So there's 10 things that we're going to walk through about all of you watching, which you can do different this year. Number one, you're not going to be surprised by this, but get on a budget. Okay, a budget, it really is. It's the easiest way to get in control of your money. When you get on a budget, you feel like you got a raise, and you're actually intentional. You are telling your money where to go. You are controlling your money. Your money is not controlling you. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes people make is they don't live on a budget. They don't live on a plan. Well, not only do you write it out, but then you do what you wrote out. I talked to a lady on the radio the other day. She'd done budgets for, for six months, and they just didn't work. And it's like she had 
$300 for groceries in a family of five. And I said, well, you're not living on that. Oh, I know. So she had like this theory on paper, yes. but then over here was her life. So you actually have to freaking do the thing you wrote down and then you will see movement. The thing about the budget is budget equals power. And you, I have never talked to someone in Financial Peace University in one-on-one -on -one coaching or on a radio call that didn't, when they finally actually wrote it down and then lived on what they wrote down, didn't get a sense of power. It was the first time they were on top of money instead of money was on top of them. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things you're going to look up on April 15th when you do your taxes next year and be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly where all my money went, right? Because most people, they're doing their taxes and they're like, oh, my gosh, where did all my money go? Yeah, because you don't live intentionally. And so the budget, it has to be a part of your financial walk. I mean, it's so hard to win financially without it. So do the budgets. Okay, number two, stop using debts. No, that's on the list, really. <laughs> I know, so shocking, so shocking. But a lot of people have a credit card as their safety net. It's their emergency fund. They depend on debt either because they're buying stuff they just simply can't afford and they want it, or they're not planning well. And I talk to a lot of people like this, that they just— they use it for their bills because they don't feel like they have enough money coming in. And it's kind of, yeah, it is that safety net. So the idea of just stop digging yourself in that hole is, is important. The first step to getting out of debt is stop. Just stop. Stop borrowing. If you stop borrowing and you pay minimum payments, 42 years later, your credit cards will be gone on average. That's, by the way, that is about right. <laughs> uh, your, your car will pay off. Eventually, your house will pay off. Even old Sally Mae will eventually get paid off. If you don't do anything extra, if you don't do anything special, if you just stop, mm. that's the first step. Now, of course, we want you to do extra. We want you to do the debt snowball. We want you to change your whole mindset around debt because that's the shortest distance between where you are and your dreams, where you are and changing your family tree, where you are and wealth and outrageous generosity. Yeah, and then people do get sucked into the idea, okay, well, I'll have my credit card because I want the points, I want to live on all of this. And so what you have to realize, though, is, is that game, you never get ahead. You never get ahead and you never win. We always laugh about this, but it's true. It's like you look at the, you look at the bank building and I'm like, mm -hmm, it's a little bit bigger than your house, isn't it? Yeah, because they're making lots of money, lots of money off of you people. So stopping with the credit card, the car loan, everything, stop going into debt. All right, number three is get serious about saving. This is something I feel like I talked to a lot of people in interviews and different things in 2020 specifically, where they're like, I'm not a great saver, but now I want to be. Mm -hmm. How do I start? What do I do to start saving? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, there's a couple of things. I mean, number one, the budget. We talk about this, making it a priority in the budget that you actually say, yes, I am going to put this amount of money away. And you put it somewhere separate. Don't keep it in your checking account. Put it just in a savings account. I don't care but actually move an amount of money. And that's just a small first step to actually get this grasp of, okay, I can save money. Because there's a lot of people that have, they don't. They just don't save at all. Well, I think the phrase that you've got there is exactly right. Get serious. Because, listen, if you needed $10,000 that you don't have today to save the life of your child, you wouldn't need a technique to save money. You wouldn't need an app to save money. You'd freaking go find $10,000 because you'd be serious. When people get serious, because after, because the, you know, the pandemic just about wiped them out, or when I went broke, I got serious, or when someone, this, when someone lost a job, they get serious. When you get serious, that's when you'll do it. And you'll find a way. And we, we've got lots of techniques and things we can show you to make it easier. Yeah. But it do, it's not going to be easy ever. And so you've got to be serious. That's right. That's right. All right, number four, as we're talking about saving, let's talk about investing. Stay the course when it comes to investing. If you're to the point that you're out of debt, you have a fully funded emergency fund, and you're investing 15% of your income into retirement, which is what we teach, and you're doing that, don't let 2020 freak you out. I mean, it was a volatile year. It ended pretty nice. Mm -hmm. It ended kind of up, mm -hmm. which is nice. But stay the course. Remember, your investing is not for short term. If you're looking at it every single day and freaking out with the ups and the downs, don't look at it. Okay, it's for the long term. I think that's hard for people to grasp. Yeah, the only ones that get hurt on a roller coaster are the ones that jump off in the middle of the ride. And if you jumped off in March and April in 2020, you jumped off at the bottom. And we're on the radio. We're on TV. We're on all the shows telling you, don't do this. Don't cash out your 401k. Don't do this unless it's to avoid a bankruptcy or a foreclosure. Don't freak out because now— not only did all of the losses from the pandemic drop return, 
but now there's a gain over that. Yeah. And you missed all of that. You, you bought at the top and sold at the bottom. This is not how you build wealth. <laughs> Econ 101. Econ 101. All right, number five, find little ways to spend less. Now, I feel like people kind of get in the mindset of what's comfortable, and so they buy the same things from the same stores, they buy the same type of food from the same grocery store, and you just kind of like live the rhythm. And I would say shake up all of your purchases. Like sit there and say, okay, what if I shopped at a different grocery store that was more, you know, less expensive? What if I actually bought clothes from a different store or waited till they're on sale? Like the little things you can do just to shake up what you're spending can actually save you money in the long run. What if you said on Amazon, I'm only doing this category, nothing else. That gets you out of the impulse, oh, the impulse land of Amazon. Yeah, that makes you know, me hurt. That yeah. would, that would have, eek, got mm-hmm. you, right? Mm-hmm. Number six, if you're married, combine your checking accounts. This is... This is a big one. People do not like this piece of advice. It's like the one piece of advice I'll put out there, even on social media, and people get so mad at me, so mad at me. But here's the deal. If you are running on two separate tracks when it comes to your marriage on any part of life, but specifically with your money, it's hard to win financially on a logistical level, but also an emotional level. Like when you say, hey, you know what? We're a team. We're at this together. We're not enemies. We're not at odds. We together can work towards goals and we can actually be a team when it comes to money, it changes the whole spirit of this conversation. If you wanted to be independent and stand on your own, you shouldn't have freaking got married, all right? The definition of marriage is a shared life. There's no way you're going to win if you don't get on the same page. When you agree on your spending, you're agreeing on your fears. When you agree on your spending, you're agreeing on your dreams. You are combining your life You are one, as the old preacher said. Quit trying to be roommates when you're married. That's what's wrong with your marriage because you're stinking selfish and you haven't given up your personal little rights in order to combine with your mate. Do this stuff. I'm telling you, this lights me up because it is the number one thing we see holding people back is they got two different people pulling two different ways all the time and then they can't figure out why they can't hit their goals because of their own little selfish self trying to be independent. That's just ridiculous. Hope I wasn't unclear. No, the Rachel Cruz show would say that it's very vulnerable. (laughs) It's very scary to combine your accounts if you never have. But no, seriously, though, but for real, I know he's the hard love person. We know that. And it's true. Everything, yes, it is all true. But to a couple that's sitting there, that may they may not have a a couple in their life that they say, oh, yeah, that's a healthy marriage. I want to be like them. And they're really on their own trying to figure this out. And the one thing that has feels safe to them— they feel like they're giving up and they're saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to combine this with you. So to that point though, it is scary and it is vulnerable. That sense of safety is an illusion Yeah, because you're damaging the very progress that you could have made. And so you've created an unsafe environment in your effort to be safe. And so it's an illusion. It's just ridiculous. Seriously. You can, we cannot find, 30 years of doing this, I can't find any data points of people who run little separate lives who go win big time in their relationships, their marriage, and their money. It just doesn't exist, guys. It really doesn't exist. So quit pushing back against it and decide, I'm either going to be married or I'm not. And if I'm going to be married, it's going to be one. All together. And again, not only will that help you with your money, you guys, but seriously, the the unity that's created within marriage with your spouse working as a team, it changes everything. It does. All right, number seven, speaking of spouses, get on the same page as your spouse. We kind of just touched on that a little bit. But getting on the same page to say, okay, if they you make the decision, yes, together we are one, we're combining accounts, we're going to work, then get on the same page. Look at your expenses. Look at your budget. Look at your goals. Look at your short-term goals, your long-term goals. Get on the same page together with where you guys want to go financially. Well, and and it does go with the other one, because when you say, I'm going to combine my finances, it doesn't say you disappeared, that you have no personal identity. When Sharon and I combined our finances, believe me, she has a freaking opinion, okay, and is pretty loud about it. There aren't any weak Ramsey women, okay? So Sharon Ramsey's loud, Dave Ramsey's quiet and meek. Yes, well, no, not really. (laughs) But, I mean, you know, she doesn't have any trouble speaking up, all right? And so we're going to combine our finances, but that doesn't mean we lost our individuality. And we're going to be on the same page, but it doesn't mean we've got a same goal over here. We're on the same page. The page is, this is where we want to go. Now, we may have some differences about personality styles, about how we're going to get there. She's a saver. I'm a spender. 
So her way is to save into it. My way is to earn into it in a sense of abundance. But we're, we all are agreeing, okay, and we can hear each other, respect each other's position, respect each other's personality style, and still be on the same page. You don't lose your identity. No, 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 no. Well, and even on a tactical level within the budget, you have a line item for you, a line item for your spouse. You each have money that you can go spend. Like it's, yes, like you're saying, you're not losing who you are. But you're saying, hey, together, we are a team and we're one. All right, number eight is stop comparing yourself to others. This is a huge one. Man, I feel like, especially during the pandemic, the social media consumption was just like out the roof. I mean, people just live online and just looking and looking and looking at what everyone else is doing. And it is so easy, so easy to compare not only like the good parts of life, but what's funny, you may not know this because you don't spend a lot of time on Instagram, but during the pandemic, So many moms were home with their kids because of school, and it, like, became a joke of, like, wine hour starts at, like, 3 p.m., and, like, Mm -hmm. everyone's just like, oh, my God, we got to get through the day. And it was almost like everybody's struggle was being compared to other people's struggle, like, who had the more struggle? Who had the more kids that struggled more than the person that did it? I mean, it's just so funny, but I'm like, the comparison game, it's just, it's constant no matter what it is. And so with your money specifically— You have to have the blinders on. You can't be looking at what everyone else is doing because you're not going to win because you're taking on someone else's goals and someone else's life versus living in your own shoes and in your own life. Someone wrote a book called Love Your Life, Not Theirs. Mm -hmm. It was a number one bestseller. Mm -hmm. And it's a good idea to do that. It really, really is. Um, When we study people who are inordinately successful with money, the millionaire study we did for Chris Hogan's book, one of the things we find is, is they... Somewhere along the line in their life, they matured and just, in most cases, almost completely lost their need to please others, their need to be impressive. And they were more concerned about their goals than what their next-door neighbor who was broke thought about it. If your broke friends are making fun of your financial plan, that means you're on track. I mean, so you've got to say, as for me and mine, this is what we're going to do. I had that beautiful advantage of having gone broke in my 20s. And in that, I I was someone who had a, I was very status conscious, what I drove, what I wore, the watch, the whole bit. And and I, you know, number one, we went broke and it just crushed us. But one of the benefits that came out of that was my need to impress others just completely went away, what the Bible calls the fear of man. Yeah. And it just changed everything. It sets you so free when you don't need to be impressive for others. Instead, impressive is hitting our family's goals, my husband and I, my wife and I, for our kids, for changing our family tree. So good. All right, number nine is to focus on your behavior. We always say that personal finance is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. So you can know all of this stuff, but if you don't do anything with it, nothing's going to change. And so that behavior change is so big. And change is uncomfortable. People like doing the same thing over and over again, even if it's not getting the result that they want. And so that behavior change, you guys, is so key in 2021. If you want a different result with your money, you have to change what you've been doing. And I talk about this a lot in my new book, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, because understanding why you do the behaviors you do is going to help you advance, not on not only with your money, but with your life. But that behavior change, focusing on behavior, is, is massive in winning financially. If I don't like the way I look, my physical condition, I don't like the way my kids are behaving. I don't like the way my marriage is operating. I don't like the way my career is operating. I don't like where we are with our money. Then it's illogical to not change. If you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to get the same results. To think otherwise is what's known as the definition of insanity. Mm-hmm. And, and so if you if you keep making a cake with using this recipe and it's chocolate and you wanted coconut, you probably need to change the recipe, <laughs> you know? Don't keep doing the same stuff over and over and just go, I wonder why it's not working. Well, you know why it's not working. Because you haven't faced the pain of change. And when the pain of same, the pain of where you are, exceeds the pain of change is the only time you'll actually change. Now, you can manifest that. You can just get disgusted enough to go, I got to lose some weight, which I did a few months ago. And and so I can't keep eating boxes of donuts and get anything but larger. Something has to stop. Something has to change, yep. Yeah, and and I think, too, for people to realize, okay— that, that there is hope on the, in the future, right? Like that hope to say, what I'm changing to is better than my present. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is, at Resolutions, we've been doing this for like 30 years, you guys. And the amount of success 
that we have seen people that do this stuff, that they live on a budget, they get out of debt, they save, they do the things that you want to change to, it works. Yeah. Like, it works. And so what the future you're working towards, have hope that it is so much better than where you are in the present if you're not happy where you are. All right, number 10, last but not least, is to live on less than you make. This is kind of like a Dave Ramsey-ism. Mm-hmm. But it's something you've been saying for, for decades. Yeah. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. Wise people save money. But a foolish man devours all he has. And I looked up when I first read that in my 20s. I thought, I'm a fool. I've been devouring everything. Everything that comes in, we spend it all and more. And and so by definition, I'm a fool. I thought, well, fools don't get ahead, so probably need to change this. And it's kind of like, hey, fool, you know, but <laughs> change your ways. Living on less than you make. All right, Dave Ramsey. That was fun. Dad, thanks for being here, for real. All right, 2021, you guys, make this the year that you change everything, that you take these small 10 I said small 10 steps. <laughs> it's not small, guys. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Again, if you don't like where you are, you have to change and you have to do something differently. So hopefully this list of 10 helped you out. And happy new year. Happy new year. Happy Good 2021. Times. Hey, guys. Rachel Cruz here. I'm obsessed. Seriously. When I found out about Tuft & Needle from Dave, I tried it out. And I'm not kidding this is the best mattress I've slept on. In fact, I ordered a second one for my guest room. You can get this mattress starting as low as $3.99. I've been talking about this for a while now, so try it out. You can keep it up to 100 nights risk-free. Now, if I'm wrong, you can send it back. But go to TN.com to get started. That's right, TN.com. And remember, it ships free. Well, one of the best parts about the internet is that we get to talk. Yes. So there are so many questions that I get via my Facebook group or Facebook in general, my page, to Instagram, to YouTube, Twitter, all of it. There's always questions regarding money. So Kenzie asks, what should a high school student be doing to save for a car or be more prepared for college? Well, the key here is to avoid debt completely, Kenzie. The earlier you can get this mindset, the better off you're going to be. So a car, you can save up. You can talk to your parents. Sometimes parents will do things like maybe match how much you've saved, or maybe you buying a car is all up to you. It doesn't matter. Either way, it is possible you can do it. So put money aside, work, save up for that car. Now, college, totally different story. totally different ball came there. So number one, again, talk to your parents. Say, hey, listen, I just need to know as I'm planning for college, you know, what you guys are thinking about. Because to be honest, some high schoolers, they get to like the point of graduation in May, their senior year, and their parents are like, oh, by the way, X, Y, and Z, either you have to pay for college or we have a college account for you that you may not have known about. So if those conversations are not happening, the earlier you can have them with your parents, the better off you're going to be. So do not, though, feel entitled that they have to pay for your school. Some parents feel guilt or the shame that they don't have money to pay for their kids' college. I don't want parents to feel that, and I don't want students to feel like that's the only way they can go to school debt-free is just from their parents, because that is not true. So talking to your parents, number one. Number two, choosing a school that you can afford. This is really important, because the moment you step over a state line or go to a private college, the tuition almost doubles, sometimes triples in some cases. So Go to a school you can afford, even if it's a community college for the first year or two. I promise, do what you can to stay in the lines of your budget. Say, okay, here's an affordable school. And then apply for scholarships and grants. This is free money. So go apply for as many as possible. Get as much money as you can. And then lastly, know if you have to work, it's going to be okay. You're going to survive in college if you have to work. So this could be getting a part-time job. It could even be working for your college or university, maybe working on campus somewhere because it can help with, with tuition reimbursement sometimes depending on the program or the situation. So look around and get creative that if you have to work to see how much of that money can be applied to college specifically. So those are some things you can do. Again, it's probably a lot that I just gave you, but working through this as early as possible, even your freshman, sophomore year, start by having those conversations with your parents and know where you're at because it is still possible today. Even though people think it's crazy, it is true. You can still go to college without student loans. Man, I love when the next generation just asks great questions. So great, so great. 
All right, guys, 2021, I mean, it's upon us, we're in it. And let this be the year that you decide, yes, I am going to get in control of my money. I am gonna get out of debt. I am gonna start living on a budget. I am going to be intentional in this area of my life. I promise you can do it. And you can have so much peace and so much less stress and worry around your money when you take control of it. All right, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And as always, if the spirit leads, you can leave a great review. And as always, make sure to take control of your money and create a life you love, especially this year, 2021. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, we have more from the Ramsey Network, like The Chris Hogan Show. I am so excited to be able to talk to you all week in and week out. We're going to talk about your money, your life, your dreams, and your goals. You know why? Because I'm your coach. Whether we're talking about building wealth, paying off your home early, investing, paying for college, and guess what? How to become an everyday millionaire. We're going to focus on taking your calls because you matter to me. Together, we can do this. This is The Chris Hogan Show. To hear full episodes, just search Chris Hogan wherever you listen to podcasts or go to chrishogan360.com.